Hello everybody, welcome to this presentation about supporting user namespaces in Kubernetes. I'm Mauricio, I work as a software engineer for Kingfolk, and this is my social data, just in case you want to reach out. In this presentation, I will be explaining you what is the motivation to implement support for user namespaces in Kubernetes. That motivation is the risk of running containers as root. I will be I explain you what user namespaces are and why they are important for the security of a Kubernetes cluster. And then I will show you a bit of history and also the work that we have been doing with the community in order to implement support for user namespaces in Kubernetes. I will also present a demo about the proof of concept that we have implemented and finally I will explain what are the next steps that we have to do in order to have this support implemented in Kubernetes. So let's get started with, with the problem. The main motivation of implementing user namespaces in Kubernetes is that running containers as root is very dangerous. Uh, when we say that a container is running as root, what it means is that a process inside the container is running as root. This process is able to perform privileged operations on the container and the host is usually protected by the isolation that the Linux namespaces provide. Unfortunately, this isolation is not perfect and in some cases a, such a process could be able to escape the container. So if a privileged process is able to escape the container, this will be very bad for the host because that process will be running as root on the host and will be able to do a lot of damage there. Mm, these are some examples of some vulnerabilities that have been found in the last year that could have been mitigated by user namespaces. The last one is uh, a special critical one because uh, in this case, an attacker is able to overwrite the runc binary on the host by just using a special container image. So after that happens, the attacker will have full control over the host machine. Mm, as I told you, these are just some examples of vulnerabilities that had been found on the, had been found on the past, and we think that this is very probably that in the future there are going to be more vulnerabilities, and also this 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 is possible that. Uh, there are some current vulnerabilities that are being exploited by the attackers. Let's see uh, some of the mitigations that we could use in order to lower the risk of running root containers. But actually the first question that we have to do is, do we really need to run the containers as root? In many of the cases, the answer to that question is not. Many of the containers that are running, are running as root today could be running without root, without any issue. If we don't need to run as root, then we could use this run as user and run as group in Kubernetes to uh, change the user and the group uh, that is used to run, to run the, the pod. This is from a uh, user point of view. From an operator point of view, we could use the policy pod security policies and also a mechanism like the, the open policy agent to control who is able to run containers as root. Uh, other mitigations that we, that we could do is to limit the set of capabilities that we give to the pod, um, just to give the capabilities that the pod needs and not give any extra capability to the pod. Also, another possibility is to use orthogonal security features that are supported by Linux and also by Kubernetes. And yeah, there are other things that we could do to mitigate the risk. Uh, one of them is to use the, an immutable operating system. Okay, so let's go into some details of user namespaces and why they are important for increasing the security. Uh, the user namespaces are just another kind of namespaces in, in the Linux kernel. This time the resource that is isolated are the user and the group's ID and also the capabilities. Um, about user and group's ID, uh, we can have a process that has different IDs inside and outside and user namespace. 
especially we could have a process that is running as root inside a username space but that process is running as non root outside the user namespace. Mm, the relationship between the IDs inside and outside the namespace is, con is controlled by an ID mapping. So what we usually have is uh, all we have in the initial host, on the host user namespace, we have all the IDs available and then we assign a portion of the range to a pod. For instance, in this case, we are saying that the UID 0 on the pod is going to be 100,000 on the host and that we are going to map 64 key uh, IDs. Mm, we can have multiple pods, so for instance in this case we have a second pod, the only difference here is that we are mapping to the ID 200,000 on the host. This is interesting to notice in this example that both pods have a different UID on the host so this is what we call non-overlapping ranges on the host and this is important from a security point of view because we are able to isolate the pods. It means that we could mitigate some of the attacks that one pod could perform against other pods. Another important feature of user namespaces is that they, they also isolate the capability. So when the kernel performs the capability ch check it takes into consideration what is the user namespace a process is running in in order to understand if the process is able to perform the privileged operation or not. Uh, there is a relationship between non-user namespaces and user namespaces. User, non-user namespaces like the network namespace, PID namespace and so on are always owned by a user namespace and a process can a process that has a capability on a user namespace can only use that capability on resources that are owned by that specific user namespace. I know that this is not easy to understand from, from that definition, so let's go into an example to make it uh, more clear. So in this case, we have a host. We have the initial host, the, the initial user namespace on the host, and we also have a network namespace on the host. In this case, the network namespace of the host is owned by the initial user namespace. In this example, we also have a pod. This pod is running with a different uh, user namespace. This user namespace is owned by the user namespace of the host, and also the network namespace of the pod is owned by the user namespace of the pod. Let's suppose that we have a process that is running inside the pod. What it means is that the process is running inside that user namespace and inside that network namespace. And the process wants to perform a privileged operation on a resource that is uh, controlled by the network namespace of the pod. For instance, let's suppose that the process wants to bind to, a, to the port 80 that requires a capability. So in this case, the kernel does the capability check using the user namespace, that is the namespace where the, where the resource is on. So in this case, the process has that capability in the user namespace and the process is able to perform that task. Uh, on the other hand, let, let's suppose that in this case, the process wants to open uh, the same port, but this time, you know, on the network namespace, okay, uh, the network namespace is owned by the initial user namespace, the capability check this time is performed against the initial user namespace, but this time that process doesn't have the capability in that user namespace, hence the process is not able to perform that operation. What is important from this example is that by using user namespaces we are able to give some capabilities to a process running in a pod, so the process can perform privileged operations on the resources that are owned by that pod, but at the same time that capability is not meaningful for resources that are not owned by that pod, for instance for resources of other pods or for resources on, on the host. Okay, let me a talk about the user namespaces supporting Kubernetes. This is the number of the cap that we have been working on. Before going into details, let me 
show you a bit of history about the user namespaces, Kubernetes and so on. So the namespaces were introduced in Linux almost 20 years ago and 10 years after in 2013 uh, the user namespaces were implementing, implemented in Linux. Uh, in the same year Docker was launched, the one year after Kubernetes was launched and in 2015 the support for user namespaces and the OCI specification was introduced and finally, in 2016, there was the first issue talking about supporting user namespaces in Kubernetes. Uh, in 2018, there was a proposal for providing some support for user namespaces in Kubernetes. And the same year, there was also a PR with that implementation for, for Kubernetes. Unfortunately, that PR was closed, so this support was not merged into Kubernetes. And then last year in 2020, we opened a new proposal for implementing this support in Kubernetes. And also in 21, this year, the support for ID mapping mounts was merged in, in Linux. I will talk a little more about why this is important for this work that we are doing. Mm, you might be wondering, uh, if user namespaces are that old, they were introduced to Linux almost uh, eight years ago, and many of the tools there are already supporting that. For instance, the different container runtimes, the OCI specification, and so on. So why Kubernetes is not supporting user namespaces? Well, this is not that easy to do, and there are some challenges that we have to overcome in order to provide support for that. Mm. The, the one of the challenges are the duplicated snapshots. So when we use user namespaces, in some cases we have to create a copy of the snapshot and we have to show to fix the ownership of that snapshot in order to create the container. So what it means is that when we create a container that is using user namespaces, we need more time to copy the snapshot and to change the ownership of that snapshot. Mm, another challenge that we have is the support for volumes. The problem is that if we have multiple containers, multiple pods that are using a different ID mapping, uh, those pods are not able to share files using volumes because the host ID of those pods is different, so there could be some issues while accessing those files in a shared storage. And other of the challenges that we have is to support high IDs. So uh, what we usually do is to assign to each pod a portion of the whole uh, host user namespace, or better, we assign a range of the IDs of the host to each container. So a process that is running inside that container is not able to use all the IDs that are, will be the will be available on the host. There are some solutions. I would say that this is, in some cases, more can work around the solution, but this is the best we can do right now. Uh, the main solution, the main workaround, let's say, is to run multiple containers with the same ID mapping. Uh, by doing that, we, we solve the problem of the volumes. We also solve the problem of the duplication of the snapshots and so on. The, Key point here is what is the granularity? How many pods do we want to share that shares the same ID mapping? Uh, okay, so for that we have defined different ID mapping modes. Each of them has a different granularity. The first idea that we have was to support a cluster mode. In this case, all the pods within the cluster share the same ID mapping. Uh, another idea, that we got from the community was to support a namespace mode. In this case, all the pods in the same Kubernetes namespace uh, share the same ID mapping. Mm, there was also another idea about service account. This is the same, the same as before, but in this case, the ID mappings are assigned for each service account. And finally, the other idea we have is to implement a pod mode where each, each pod gets a different and non-overlapping mapping. So the idea is not to implement only one of them, the idea is to 
to see what of them makes sense and which one of them we should implement. So let's make a comparison of the different modes. So in the left, we have the different modes I just presented to you. And on the top, we have the different uh, challenges that we have and also the path to path isolation offered by each mode. So in the case of the cluster mode for the duplicate snapshot issue, it provides a, a good solution because uh, we have all the posts sharing the same ID mapping on the uh, on the cluster. So basically, we are able to to reuse the same snapshot for all the containers in the cluster. In the case of the namespace uh, and service account modes, the, this is a this offer a more or less good solution. Let's say a medium solution because in this case we are only able to reuse the snapshot within the same namespace. So we we have a container that is running in two different namespaces or two different service accounts, then we will have to create different copies of the snapshot for the, for those containers. Uh, for the pod, this is really bad. In this case, all the pods are using a different ID mapping. We have to create a different uh, snapshot for each pod. Uh, regarding the support for volumes for the cluster, mode this is pretty good because yeah again we have the same id mapping for all the pods so we are able to share a volume with with all the pods in the cluster mm, for the namespace the support is more or less medium because in this case we are able to share the volume uh, across the pods inside the same namespace or same service account but we are not able to uh, share that volume between pods that are running in different namespaces. And finally, for the pod case, this is again very bad because we could only share a volume with a single pod. Uh, regarding the support for high UIDs, the cluster offers a very good solution for that because in this case we could assign a pretty big range of UIDs to the cluster and then each pod within the cluster will be able to use all those IDs. Mm, for this, for the namespace on service account modes, this is bad because in this case, we have to coordinate the allocation in the different nodes of the cluster. Uh, and we also have to guarantee that the probability of a collision is very low. What it means is that we only can, can assign a low number of IDs to each a namespace or to each service account. Um, for the pod case, the solution in this case is good because um, we, uh, we don't have to coordinate the location between the different nodes. So in this case, the only thing that we have to guarantee is that the pod in each node doesn't uh, get an overlapping mapping. So in this case, we are able to give to each pod, uh, uh, let's say a pretty big range. Mm, regarding the pod to pod isolation, in the cluster case, this is very bad. Of course, we are sharing the same ID mapping, so basically there is no isolation between the pods in this case. For the namespace and the service account case, this is more or less medium. We have some isolation between pods running on different namespaces or different service accounts, but we don't have isolation for pods running on the same namespace or service account. Uh, for the pod case, it offers the develop isolation because in this case we have a different ID mapping for each pod. So basically the pods are, uh, isolate, are fully isolated. Okay, let me show you a demo about a proof of concept that we implemented with the support in Kubernetes. In this demonstration, I will show how we can protect the host against some of the vulnerabilities I showed you before by using user namespaces. I will use just the RunC vulnerability. So what I have here is a RunC binary that, that has that vulnerability. This is a very old version that was released before uh, that vulnerability was fixed. Mm, and here I have uh, a local Kubernetes cluster running on, on my machine. Mm, what this vulnerability does in this case is that it writes a, a string to the RunC binary. So before running the, uh, 
exploit. Let me show you that we don't have that string on the runc binary. And let me show you what is the exploit that I'm going to use. So this is just a standard pod template. Mm, the only important part here is that I'm using a special image that contains a exploit for that vulnerability. So let me create that pod. And let's wait a little bit until that pod is running. So this is already running. Let's look at the logs of that pod. So we can see that, yeah, in this case, the exploit says that the runc binary was updated. Let's check if that actually happened. So yes, in this case, we can see that the exploit in the container was able to override the runc binary and in this case it just add a string to the binary let me reinstall the original runc binary the string is not present anymore and let me show you how we can mitigate that vulnerability by using username space so this is another path template this is almost the same te template i have before the only modification is that in this case i enabled the usage of user namespaces by using the cluster mode I displayed before. So let's create this pod. Let's wait a little bit until that is running. Okay, so the pod is done. Let's get the logs of the pod. So in this case, we, we see that there was an error. What it means is that the exploit was not able to modify the runc binary because in this case, the UID that the exploit was using on the host was not the owner of the runc binary. And yeah, in fact, if we check the runc binary we can see that the string is not present in that case so yeah this is just a quick demonstration of some of the vulnerabilities that we could prevent by using user namespaces okay so what are the next steps that we have to do in order to implement this support in kubernetes mm, probably the first thing that we should start doing is to consider the id map and feature that is now merged in the linux kernel so this is a feature that will be available in Linux 5.12. And this is a feature that provides a real solution for the duplicated snapshots and the volume sharing issues. Mm. Uh, in other words, with this feature, we are able to implement the pod mode without all the complications that we were having. So if we look at the modes comparison, again, taking into consideration the ID map and mount feature, where we can see that now the duplicated snapshots and the support for volumes um, in all the solutions we could have an excellent support because we have support for that on the kernel. So this is something that we don't have to care about. Um, the support for high UIDs and pod to pod isolation is just the same. The, so in this case, we will have to make the decision about which modes to implement based on this, only these two features. And we don't have to consider anymore the duplicated snapshots on the support for volumes issues. Uh, as we can see in this case, the pod mode looks like a very good candidate to implement because it has good support for high UITs and also it offers excellent uh, pod to pod isolation. Okay, so just before finishing, this is just some reference material, just in case you want to know more details. Uh, some documentation about username spaces, capabilities, and so on in the Linux kernel. Two blog posts we wrote about the work that we have been doing with the community. Uh, also, the pull request for the CAP, and some more information about ID map and mounts. I think this is all. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any question that you can have.